Welcome to the um, 2017 ASW Rosenbach Lectures in Bibliography. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, and there's probably many of you here who don't, uh, my name is Carton Rogers, and I'm the Vice Provost and Director of Libraries at Penn. And it's my distinct honor to kick off this year's lecture series. The Rosenbach Fellowship in Bibliography, the endowment fund that supports these annual lectures, was established by the trustees of the University of Pennsylvania in 1928 and honors a gift for that purpose from ASW Rosenbach, one of America's greatest book dealers and collectors. Its intention, which in the main we have held to during the intervening years, was to further scholarship and scholarly publication in bibliography and book history writ large. The first Rosenbach lecture was delivered in 1931 by Christopher Morley. Since Morley's inaugural lecture, over 70 of the preeminent scholars in the fields of descriptive bibliography, scholarly editing, papermaking, book history, and most recently the electronic book have delivered the Rosenbach lectures. Identifying scholars for these lectures has occupied generations of Penn Library directors faculty library committees, and curatorial staff. A review of extant records are useful reminders of some of those conversations. There are also reminders, very appropriate uh, reminders in light of this year's lecture, that we have come a long way. On April 11, 1932, the faculty committee on the library here at Penn discussed who should be invited to be the next Rosenbach lecturer. A faculty member named Dr. Baugh suggested Seymour DeRici, who he described as an outstanding American bibliographer now associated with the Library of Congress. That suggestion was followed by a long discussion of whether or not the $500 income from the fund was a sufficient honorarium for four lectures. And then this useful suggestion from an unidentified committee member Quote, the lectures might be given every two years. I assume so the amount of money to spend would be $1,000. And then occasionally we could get a man from abroad, such as W.W. Gregg, R.V. McCarrow, or J. Dover Wilson. The Penn librarian at the time, Seymour Thompson, chimed in with this not particularly useful piece of information. He had, quote, already spoken with Mr. Rosenbeck about the difficulty in getting first-class men. And unfortunately, <laughs> I'll let that sink in for a minute. Um, unfortunately, male lecturers had stayed uh, for the Rosenbach lectures until 1955 when Dorothy Minor, curator of manuscripts at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore, came and lectured on the medieval illustrated book. This is worth noting, not only because she broke the Rosenbach Lecture's gender barrier, but also because of her home institution. The Walters is the former employer of our own Will Knoll, director of the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books, and Manuscripts, who for many years held the same position as Dorothy Minor. In addition, the Penn Libraries currently hosts 132,622 images from these illuminated manuscripts and books at the Walters on our OPEN website. Most of these were digitized during Will's uh, time at the Walters Museum. So this is a wonderful circle uh, and a, a very nice um, uh, salute, I think, to Dorothy Minor, who Will described in an email to me as a goddess. And uh, again, I'll let your imagination um, <laughs> A final trip down memory lane, and then I will uh, step away from the microphone and let the lectures begin. In October of 1953, the then director of libraries, Charles W. David, reported that his plan to have Professor Zechariah Chafee of Harvard Law School dubbed Dangerous to America by Senator Joseph McCarthy give a series of lectures in the spring of 1944 on the history of the right to remain silent to avoid self-incrimination. 
a curious choice in the context of the purpose of the Rosenbach lectures, but not so odd given the time. Um, unfortunately, this plan had been wrecked by Professor Chafee's illness. Dr. David had, however, succeeded in securing Professor Fredson T. Bowers of the University of Virginia to talk about Shakespeare and textual criticism, criticism no doubt a safer topic. <laughs> I'm sure that Professor Bowers was terrific, but I, for one, would have loved to hear Professor Chafee on the right to remain silent, <laughs> which is a lesson I probably should have learned a long time ago. Um, for the past decade, the Rosenbach lectures have settled into a pattern of three lectures delivered over four nights, as well as a graduate seminar. During this time, the Penn Libraries and the University of Pennsylvania Press have worked closely together, uh, organizing the Rosenbach lectures and uh, usually uh, having those lectures published. The organizing committee uh, for the lectures is comprised of members of the Kislak Center, the Penn Press, Penn faculty, and currently a non-Penn representative. The libraries host the lectures in the class of 78 Orrery Pavilion and since 2007, the annual lecture series are available online for download. Again, typically, a Rosenbach lecturer signs a book contract with the Penn Press, and recently published Rosenbach lectures are for sale at the press book table in front of the elevators. Let me also quickly mention that the Rosenbach lectures form part of a loose coalition with other bookish initiatives within the Penn Libraries and with the History of Material Text Seminar, which meets weekly during the academic year here in the Kislak Center. The recently created Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies has also made significant contributions to the study of manuscripts in the digital age. Perhaps there will be a center or academic program in the study of the book established here at Penn at some point in the future, one can only hope. Before asking Professor Rita Copeland, the Shelley Z. and Burton X. Rosenberg Professor of Humanities to come forward and introduce Dr. Mary Crothers, our 2017 ASW Rosenbach Lecturer, I'd like to thank the uh, Lectures Committee for their work in selecting such an uh, outstanding and renowned speaker. Uh, David McKnight, director of the Annenberg Rare Book and Manuscript Library, for all of his hard work in support of the lectures. Alita Arthur is the library's events coordinator for arranging Dr. Crothers' accommodation. And a final word of thanks to Tom Hensel for recording uh, these lectures and making them available. And I hope that uh, after the lecture tonight, you'll be able to join me for a reception which will take place in the Mollus Reading Terrace just out, outside of the pavilion. So with that, Professor Rita Copeland to introduce this year's ASW Rosenbach Lecture. No body of work better captures the spirit of the Rosenbach Lectures in bibliography than that of Mary Carruthers, whose scholarship reveals the materiality of thought the mise en page of memory, and the sensory reflexes of the book. Born in India, educated at Wellesley and Yale, she is the Remark Professor Emeritus of Literature at NYU, fellow, quondam, of All Souls College, Oxford, author of many books, and the recipient of numerous honors, including Corresponding Fellow of the British Academy, Fellow of the Medieval Academy of America and currently President of the Fellows and formerly President of the Academy itself, the Guggenheim Fellowship, fellowships from the Getty Research Institute, ACLS, NEH, the Newbury, the Huntington, and an honorary degree from Oxford University. <clears throat> she began her career in medieval studies exploring the shape-shifting la landscape of Langland's Piers Plowman. To know the profundities of that text is to be prepared for any cognitive challenge. <laughs> Her interests soon migrated to the terrain of ancient and medieval rhetoric, which she traverses far beyond its usual roots. Her optique has opened pre-modern rhetoric to encompass memory in its psychic and physical dimensions, sound, image, space, the three-dimensionality of architecture and topography, the book itself 
as inner and outer map, and the pleasures of style, what she calls ordinary beauty. Her 1990 study, The Book of Memory, now a canonical resource in all humanistic disciplines and for scientists too, approaches memory as a pre-modern practice of psychology, the oldest kind of artificial intelligence. Memory was a storage house, but it was also the fuel of thought and the engine of meditation and ethics. These various functions are witnessed in art and material texts, in medicine, pedagogy, and hermeneutics. In 1998, she published The Craft of Thought, for which she won the Medieval Academy's highest prize, the Haskins Medal. This tells the cross-historical story of the impulsion to think. Here, rhetorical invention is both ingenium, the machinery of thought, and a certain mental receptivity. And most recently, she has extended her understanding of rhetoric and persuasion into the broad field of aesthetics. Studies on perception, sensation, and bodily affect, weeping, sweetness, and on the stylistic principles of variety and abundance. These are the studies that comprise her most recent book, The Experience of Beauty in the Middle Ages. I recently had the pleasure of using this book, The Experience of Beauty, for an interdisciplinary workshop representing fields from literature to medieval textiles. It is testimony to the reach of Mary's work that it can illuminate such a cross-section of disciplines answering the deepest questions that people have about their own most familiar material. This power of her work inspires audiences across the humanities and the sciences. She brings the Middle Ages close to us by elucidating the mental processes implicit in its verbal and visual expressions. But she also reminds us that the pre-modern is another country in which rhetorical form was the medium of thought. In trying to summarize the effect of her work, I realize that it is best experienced through reading and hearing, rather than being described, even with the warmest admiration. So I ask you now to welcome Mary Carruthers, who will speak tonight on geometry and the topics of invention. Wow, <clears throat> and that's from an old friend. <laughs> thank you very much, Rita, and thank you, everyone at Penn and from, from other parts of the, of the East Coast for coming to these lectures. Uh, I have a very long association with Philadelphia. Actually, I was in high school here uh, years and years and years ago. Not as long ago, however, as the Rosenbach lectures began. <laughs> I'm going to start with these two texts that I've put up here, these two texts which I think are sort of going to haunt these lectures, uh, not just this first one, but really throughout the entire series. First, a, an etymology from Isidore of Seville, Nam et mens memoria est, for indeed mind is memory. And then from Hugh of St. Victor's Didascalicon, geometry, and I'll just read you the English translation, geometry is the teaching of fixed measurements and the depiction of shapes for contemplating through which the boundaries of each and every matter can be made clear. In other words, geometry is, quote, the wellspring of our cognitions an originator of the things we say. Now, in the Didascalicon, from which the Hugh of St. Victor quote is taken, discussing the liberal arts, this is what Hugh of St. Victor writes of geometry. Again, that it's the teaching of fixed measurements and the depiction of shapes for contemplating, through which the boundaries of each and every matter can be made clear. That's part of the standard definition of geometry in the uh, liberal arts. And then he adds, in other words, geometry is the wellspring of our sensory cognitions and the originator of the things we say. 
When I first came upon this statement in Hugh, I was greatly puzzled. What did geometry have to do with speaking, contemplation, and indeed uh, our sensory cognition understanding? I understood, of course, that geometry was concerned with measuring fixed forms in contrast to astronomy, which dealt with moving bodies. That distinction is commonplace in medieval definitions of the quadrivium. Nor, unfortunately, did I then, when I first came across this, take sufficient notice of Jerome Taylor's comment on this passage in his translation of Didascalicon. For Hugh is quoting a maxim found both in Cassiodorus and Isidore of Seville, and the full, I mean, he's quoting only as a fragment of it, Fonte Sensuum et Origo Dictionum, but the quotation is not complete. Cassiodorus' complete dictum, copied fully by Isidore in his etymologies, is, in this wonderful manuscript of Cassiodorus, Topica sunt argumentorum sedes fontes sensuum et origines dictionum. The topics are the seats of arguments, wellsprings of our sense-based cognitions, and originators of the things that we say. By Hugh's time, the maxim was commonplace and so well known that without special attribution, Hugh could fold it into a much longer sentence. Hugh's originality lies in where he cites it, in so startlingly unexpected a context that any of his contemporaries would likely have taken notice. For the earlier writers had always applied it only in their discussions of the trivium, specifically to the topica, as indeed in this manuscript, the system of topics taught in ancient logic and rhetoric for finding and developing arguments during invention. That is, invention as part of rhetoric. Topical reasoning always had this dual function, just as dialectic and rhetoric were considered two aspects of the same rational arguing, same, sorry, rational instrument, just as the same hand offers both the closed fist of dialectic and the open hand of rhetoric, or in Aristotle's model, the strophe and antistrophe basic to a Greek chorus. Now, how and why Hugh understood this commonplace of late antique topical logic and rhetorical invention to be also the property of a quadrivial subject, namely geometry, is a question central to my subject this week, of using diagrams as cognitive instruments, not only as the condensed transmitters of some body of knowledge to be learned, such as subject-focused topographies and anatomies, and taxonomies of agreed, generally agreed knowledge. I mean, that is one thing that diagrams do, and some diagrams only do that. To quote the early modern historian James Franklin's 2000 essay, which you have on your bibliography, uh, on, quote, on diagrammatic reasoning and modeling in the imagination, in quoting, Euclid's elements is not a picture book of shapes. The point of Euclid is to reason about the diagrams and to expose the necessary interrelations of spatial parts, end quote. And he goes on to observe, quote, Galileo's famous saying that the universe is written in the language of mathematics, which of course for us would be algorithmic statements such as A equals pi r square uh, and uh, E equals mc squared. Galileo's saying, which you remember is about the language of mathematics, continues in the original, Franklin says, its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures, without which it is humanly impossible to understand a single word of the natural order. For Galileo, geometry described the building blocks of creation, as it did also for medieval writers and continued to do well into the 17th century, not only for natural creation and the human arts, but for all creative human thinking generally. I mean, that is the essence of what Galileo's claim is. In a brief work on lines, angles, and shapes, the English scientist Bishop Robert Grosstest, uh, at the end of the 12th century, observed some 400 years before Galileo, quote, the benefit of considering lines, angles, and shapes is of the utmost, since it is impossible to understand natural philosophy 
without them, end quote. This is a medieval commonplace. And I've discovered, thanks to the online digitized manuscript trove of the great library of the Monastery of St. Gall, that Hugh's linking of topics with geometry isn't as unique as I thought it was. After all, an early 11th century manuscript of various works, De Topica, includes, situated between Cicero's Topica and Boethius's own De Differentiis Topicis, a work on geometry, geometria, thought then to be by Boethius, plus another pseudo-Boethian work on rhetorical cognition, De Rhetorice Cognitione, neither of which have been edited, of course. The aspects of geometry I want to focus on this week are specifically inventive and generative, productive of complex new knowledge in the ways that the methods and tools of any craft are required for making a new work. The topical sedes argumentorum are equally termed fontes and origines in the uh, maxim as there. The cognitive model employed is that of conception, gestation, and birth, not of a mechanical assembly line from prefabricated parts. Concepts in the Middle Ages develop from sensory data into ideas as embryos develop into babies. Indeed, only by employing this model can the topica be understood as the irrigating wellsprings and originators of our fully universalized intellectual ideas about ourselves, our societies, and all of physical nature. And in this model, it is also significant that fontes are always wet. For, as elementary medieval physics knew, moisture is necessary to create any new shapes out of one's discovered materials. The harnessing of imagining to the purposes of reasoning is accomplished through remembering. This mental activity, variously called recollectio and vis rememorativa and reminiscentia, is the bridge between sense-derived cognitions and intelligent thinking. I think some of you recognize that one. In this diagram, note particularly the dragon-like creature, which is This dragon-like creature placed in the brain channel or nervous between vis cognitiva or imaginativa, its alternate name, and vis uh, mem memorativa. Now the nervi, which gives us of course our word nerve, were thought to be hollow channels that carry the movements of the body's animating spirits, which are the means of communication both within the brain and between it and the body more generally. In many ways, one of the things I'm going to be discussing is an aspect of mind-body problem. I'm just warning you about that. <laughs> Set into motion by some affect, which can be from an external or internal cause, these spirits move along like ripples in a pond, to invoke a common metaphor. And such movements are constant and continuous. Our brain never stops its motions, even when we are asleep. You can think of the spirits also as expressions of the soul, of anima, within the body, the soul being that energy that activates all our flesh. A reasoning, any sort of ordered thinking, needs an instrument to control the flow of conceptualized thought objects when they are summoned for any intellectual activity. And this instrument in the brain was called, starting with Galen actually, was called the vermis. And in standard Galenic medicine, it was considered to be a body that by alternately thickening uh, and elongating, it regulated the spiritual movements of memories. In this context, medieval Latin spiritualis is synonymous with our word mental, a word whose Latin original, mentalis, comes into regular use only towards the end of the Middle Ages. So when they talk about spiritualis, especially before oh, I'd say the middle of the 13th century, you have to remember very often it means mental. We would 
we would use the word mental. Early medical texts observed that people commonly raise their heads when seeking to remember something and lower them when reasoning. <laughs> Think of Rodin. These acts engage the vermis, opening to let memories out and closing to shut them off. So the vermis is the gatekeeper of memories during all conscious recollection, but during sleep or if the brain is addled, the vermis does not function and images can pour forth helter-skelter as hallucinations and dreams. In this manuscript picture, the worm-like creature is of course a visual pun and mnemonic for vermis. This diagram of the, of the cognizing process is in Cambridge University manuscript GG11, a miscellany of materials composed chiefly in Anglo-French and Latin, but some in English too, that were made in the English West Midlands. The most recent catalog of illuminated manuscripts in the Cambridge University Library dates it to about 1330, the beginning of the reign of Edward III. It contains some romances, prayers, and other pastoral material, some land accounts, a brut, a history of Britain, written in French and followed by a poem also in French on the death of Edward I. In short, it's the kind of eclectic stuff that one would expect in a large book used on diverse occasions in an English landed household in the early 14th century. And it also contains, just before some excerpts of moral commentaries on Job, this short digest of Avicenna's account of sensory cognition, which is in turn, of course, a commentary on Aristotle and derived from Aristotle, and it's accompanied by this small picture. It's no more than about three inches by two inches in the manuscript. Notice that it diagrams a continuous process. Okay, this is not discrete little chambers. This is a continuing process Notice also it's a diagram, it's not an anatomical drawing. I stress this now because, in fact, I'm beginning to become a bit cautious about showing this figure at all, since it's taken on something of a life of its own, and I think it's very frequently misunderstood to be simply a, an image of standard, say, 17th century, 18th century faculty psychology. It is not. All that it diagrams is the standard early scholastic count, account of how a mental representation comes into being. This is what neuroscientists talk about now. They talk about mental representations. It does not include, notice, any remembering process. As you can see, recollection, reminiscentia, recollectio, vis rememorativa, appears nowhere in it. Nor does ratio, reasoning. Instead, a form of the Latin root imaginati is recorded as the alternative form for each phase in this perceptual process. In other words, this is a diagram demonstrating the pre-modern understanding of what we call imagination. The picture shows what imagination does as a complex of activities that enable us to conceptualize the data our senses receive and to recall it in a manner that our thinking brain can use as a mental representation. The picture shows schematically how such data from the various external senses are received into the brain. So you have the common sense up here. Go. Sensus communis, vel fantasia, and are combined into something that we cognize as a coherent shape or forma. This or malice, which is up here. This, later, this latter action is labeled imaginatio vel formalis. We also make an initial definition or estimation about our perceptions, judging the source as hurtful or beneficial to be avoided, ignored, or approached. In philosophical, modern philosophical language, we make a percept out of what our senses take in which at the same time also we form mentally as a concept. So it's with the aid of formalis and with this estimativa up here, uh, as it was then called, sometimes it's called vis de definens, um, 
with those two things is what we make our concepts from. It's not only a sensory shape, but also some notion that we have of it. In the diagram, this conceptualizing process is called cogitatio, which is down here. There we go. Cogitation. It too involves our mental imaging abilities for the alternate name given to it is imaginativa. And notice it says cogitatio, it does not say cognitio. This is important too. Some of these perceptions then consolidate in our brains after some period of time as what we call memories. Notions that remain in some way accessible to us, literally recollectable as we reason. These wholly mentalized notions are the embryonic materials from which, having recollect them, recollected them, rather, we can then shape and give birth to our full ideas. In scholastic discourse, this brain fashion concept is sometimes called an intentio, sometimes a notitio. I tend to use the English word notion, which also works well in French, notion. Aristotle called these mental constructs noeta. Philosophers of mind sometimes use the term thought objects. Whatever word is used, a notion is not yet a memory. Only after the cognizing and imagining process is completed in this diagram during cogitatio vel imaginativa, and then consolidated by vis memorativa, going to the back here, so there's cogitatio, the vermis, and memorativa, which is the consolidating um, ability. Only at that point does a notion become available for recollecting. And for this reason, memoria, a memory, is of necessity praeterita, of something that is past, that is no longer present, that is gone. No longer present simply to our external senses, not necessarily to our minds. A medieval dictionary, the Derivaciones of Huguccio of Pisa from about 1190, repeats Isidore of Seville's derivation of Latin mens and memoria, which I showed you earlier, as being from the verb memini, and then goes on to say that memoria is also related to Latin mora, a delay. For indeed, mind is memory, and a memory <clears throat> is the stable lingering in our mind of our cognitions, whence indeed the word is derived from delay, mora. For it is also said by etymology that memoria is a kind of delay within the mind, something that hangs around. In this generative psychology, which is basic to medieval philosophy of mind, absolutely, Recollection is always a remaking, a remembering, a recollection. A recollected concept always had to be reimagined when it was reconstructed. It was never the same as the phantasm or forma initially produced and delayed as a memory. This is fundamental to comprehend. One important consequence of this idea, I think, is that mnemonic accuracy was quite different and differently based, differently evaluated issue for medieval scholars than it is now for us. Because a memory is always of a past experience, remembering can only be an action of remaking in the present. Remember that a memory is not present. It has to be made present. Specifically, by means of a search, starting from what you know now, a habit you may have, and reasoning by a chain of remembered associations until you find what you're looking for. This was known as ratiocination, ratiocinatio, a term familiar from Roman logic and rhetoric throughout the Middle Ages. Think of it as a sort of itinerary, a journey in stages from what you know now, that is starting from some memory that you can now call up, to discover by a planned chain of associations what you have forgotten. This reconstructive search was called investigatio rememorativa, uh, rememorative investigation. And among the scholastics, it alone is defined as genuine remembering. 
While they also recognized what we call spontaneous recollection, they regarded it correctly, I think, as just a disorderly haphazard misuse of mnemonical method. Uh, it is even called abusive, abusive, a term from grammar, for it is a misuse of recollective method, just as jumbled grammar is a misuse of grammatical method. It's the shape of these structured investigations, their formal organization or dispositio, to use the, the, the term from classical rhetoric and medieval rhetoric. It's that formal organization, the structure, that is crucial to their intellectual usefulness, not just their contents per se. All diagrams, through the articulation of their parts, invite specific types of internal movements, relationships, and thus imply particular logical processes. The ways in which a diagram can take you from one place to another how its topics are disposed, what sorts of movement are designed into it, in that lies its investigatory and inventive power, and inevitably also its limitations. Scholars now tend to classify diagrams by their audiences. And we talk about school diagrams, preacher's diagrams, diagrams for surgeons, diagrams for singers, sometimes known as a musical score, and so on. And we also classify them by their content, vices and virtues, divisions of knowledge, human anatomy, cosmology, and so forth. But medieval classifications most commonly denominate shapes, wheels of this and that, trees of this and that, ladders, towers, cherubs, spheres, and several more. The implied internal motions of these basic shapes can be linear, compartmental, genealogical, circular, spiral, diagonal. They can imply a planar geometry, two-dimensional geometry, or a solid geometry, or even a geometry so complex that it is best considered through mathematical topology, as indeed an article on the tre giri uh, in Canto 33 of the Paradiso recently did, with the aid, I might say, of some mathematical topologists, a wonderful example of multidiscipline uh, work. What constitutes a recollective search or investigation is also discussed by Augustine. And his characterization of recollection in his De Trinitate, book 11, remained key throughout the Middle Ages, well into, well, I would say, even up through the 14th century. There are at least two kinds of recollective, reconstructive, recollection. In one kind, you can recall now that you once made a memory of something, but you no longer can see what the content of that memory was. <clears throat> this is the, um, I know I know that, but I just can't remember what it is. That situation, uh, your present remembering that in the past you made a memory of something, if you could only remember what that was. <clears throat> Your task then is to discover again your memory for that content, but notice not the initial content as you first retained it, for that affect or motion in Aristotelian terms is no longer present in you. So you reconstruct by reasoning sequentially from a memory that you now can locate until you can find the forgotten notion that has been obletus, in Latin literally smeared over and that you now wish to recollect in the present. In order to use it for thinking, you must recreate it with the aid of a newly fashioned image. The usual example given in scholastic writings is to try to remember what you did four days ago by starting from a memory you can now recall, perhaps of what you did yesterday, and from there reconstructing two days ago, and then three days ago, and then finally four days ago. Or you can proceed in the opposite direction if that works better, from four days ago to yesterday, if that's what you actually need to do. You have great flexibility in how to proceed so long as your association chains are stable. Another and much more interesting kind of re rememorative investigation of one's concepts occurs when one seeks to understand matters that one has never experienced oneself. A common scholastic example derived from Averroes is how a person who has never seen an elephant can yet conceive of one 
from having it described in words only. One must investigate one's conceptual store also in order to think through matters that can never be directly cognized, such as abstract ideas like triangularity. To consider what is, a, what is triangle-ness, the abstract, Aristotle says one must, imagine, one must imagine a triangular shape, understanding that one is not defining this particular triangle image, but rather using it to understand an idea of triangularity. Augustine used other examples, such as, I never saw St. Paul, but I can fashion a working mental image of him by recalling and reimagining my notions of man, and possibly bald, in order to comprehend the thought of St. Paul. Similarly, though I have never been to Ephesus, says Augustine, I can imagine what the city may be like because I have a memory of my experience of another city, and for Augustine, it was, of course, Carthage. And so I can comprehend city of Ephesus as a phrase as, and as an idea. And I can also conceive of things I could never experience and that don't even exist because I can combine my recollected concepts in new ways. Augustine's example is a black swan. In ancient logic, this was a standard example of a categorical contradiction. Since this is an ontological contradiction, in nature it cannot actually exist. But because I can recall my notions of swan and also of black and visualize them together, I can indeed imagine and understand the idea black swan in the abstract, as we would now say, as a generalized metonym for logical contradictions. We now call this using our imaginations, and of course we revere the imagination as our greatest creative ability, by some romantics claimed even to be independent of both memory and reason. But as I have observed often in print, in medieval psychology, including both Augustinian and scholastic psychology, what we call creative imagination was analyzed as rememoration, a conscious investigation of our conceptualized memories, which are reconstituted for intellectual use by our recollecting and re-imaging abilities. For this reason, investigatio rememorativa was regarded as the all-important bridge between our conceptualized experiences and our intellect, between body and mind. Another way of stating the idea is to say, using the etymology that comes from Varro, Isidore, and still in the recent Oxford Latin Dictionary, that mens is from memini, and thus memoria mens est, just as Isidore said. Now, in procedures of thinking, the fundamental character that each diagram shape offers affords a framework of recognition, and that's a phrase uh, from Franklin's article. This privileges how you look before what you see. What's now called perceptual learning, a phrase I've just learned, perceptual learning via processes of pattern detection and pattern making. It is not a passive, wholly receptive matter at all. Many of us are familiar with it from the famous duck-rabbit ink blot test. And a few years ago, I read a newspaper account of a group of DNA genome researchers whose work was resulting in a very large big data store, needless to say. And they'd had the wisdom to bring in an artist to teach them how to expand the meager set of patterns with which they were attempting to shape and analyze their random seeming data, teaching them to visualize using a more varied stock of possible patterns. Diagrams help train our perceptions, our abilities for seeing and making patterns, and therefore for finding relationships within our world. The user's judgment, the word for which, Latin word for which, of course, is arbitrium, is involved one's free judgment constituted of both reason and volition. For ratio means plan and pattern, voluntas, desire and choice, and different patterns embody and invite different perceptions of the same content and require us to judge not only what, but how we are seeing. 
To see the same matters so differently, I submit, does indeed change and I think free up how we are able to understand them. Design isn't just an ornamental vestment that can be cast aside for the real stuff, or the chaff for the wheat, as it were. I think we all know this, but we sometimes act as if we didn't. When in our classifications, we lazily separate the content out from the organizing pattern. A common feature of medieval lexicon used in geometry, I'm leaving this picture up here because I want you to take a very close look at these two, okay? Um, common feature of the medieval lexicon used in geometry will likely be particularly odd and perhaps even counterintuitive to us, unless as scholars of manuscripts we've learned to see shapes within medieval conventions. The simple Euclidean two-dimensional planar shapes, square, circle, triangle, when one encounters them in diagrams, especially as structures of topical invention, need often to be understood as three-dimensional solids. A cube, or cubit as we known, a sphere, and a tetrahedron. Or to use the terms even more common in medieval geometric thought, quadratures, roundnesses, and triangularities. In the standard definition, Known from Boethius and Isidore, the geometry of a plane is in two dimensions, length and width. Solids, however, are measured with the third dimension, which we call height, and in Latin can be designated by three synonymous words, altitudo, sublimitas, and spicitudo, or density. When drawn onto a flat surface, like a manuscript page, this third dimension has to be compressed into the planar two, and yet somehow also indicated to a reader. Okay, I'll come back to these. I'm just showing these to you now because I want you to get a sense of how very different these are. Here we're going up, around. Here we're also going around, but we're going, not going up in quite the same way. I'm gonna talk about this again tomorrow. I think it's tomorrow, maybe it's the third. I'll give you a hint right now. They both need to be understood as solids. They both need to be understood as buildings. This is a circular round building. We are looking down from the top of the dome. And this, of course, is a more traditional architectural solid uh, tower, essentially. OK. So how do these third dimensions get up there? So I said, they, the third dimension has to be both compressed and somehow indicated to a reader. So here are some examples of drawing on a manuscript page of three-dimensional shapes. These are taken from a 12th century manuscript here at Penn in the Schoenberg collection of a geometry composed in the later, 12th, uh, later 10th century rather by Gerbert of Ariac, who became Pope Sylvester II in 999 and died in 1003. While the content of Gerbert's geometry incorporates Euclid via Boethius, some of the figures that are used in the manuscripts of this work are very unusual to us as geometric shapes, although they occur also in other geometry manuscripts of the same time. <clears throat> when some progression in space-time is included within the graphic form, such as when graphing melodies, genealogies, and itineraries, a temporal dimension can also be understood through the figure, which is only seemingly, especially to us, two-dimensional and static. Indeed, all invention diagrams imply some virtual movements. One must, as it were, walk about within them, mentally, and in the full variety of ways that the different shapes invite. When dame geometry, introduces herself in Martianus Capella's fifth century epic poem of the marriage of Mercury and philology, she comments that the quality of solidness, three dimensions, soliditas, is what makes the basic two-dimensional figures productive. Solid, solidity truly efficate schemata generalia. So to make a square, truly productive, for that is what the verb efficere means, 
Imagine it as a cube, as here. Conceive of a circle diagram as a sphere or even possibly as a cone, because I've seen that drawn as well, and of a triangle as a prism, or if it has a square base, a pyramid. Mental manipulation, moving and changing shapes about with the mind's imagining abilities, needs a third and sometimes even a fourth dimension. And indeed, Gerbert and other medieval geometricians give very little space in their geometries to the simple figures, the schemata generalia. But as Gerbert writes, the two-dimensional square figure he has drawn for the solid cube, the cubitus, needs to be amplified into three dimensions. And opposite the text on that is where this particular figure is drawn. Since the equal measurements of a six-sided cube can't be drawn clearly, and his word for that is aperte, openly, clearly, onto a plane surface, one needs to e imagine it either mentally, he says, mente intelligile, his instructions for this, you need to imagine it, or, should you be so dull, uh, you can fashion one for yourself uh, in um, wood or wax, <laughs> or some such material that can readily be shaped. Let me give you an example. So we've seen Gerbert of Aurillac's figure for a cube or a quadrata solida as drawn in two manuscripts. And you see, uh, here they are. They're 100 years apart. And you notice that it consists of two four-sided figures, one drawn parallel to and inside the other. You also notice the four diagonal lines drawn from the four corners of the outer quadrature to the corresponding four corners of the inner one. I think it's easier to see if I go back, actually, to this one. You can see it very clearly here. OK, so we've got the inner and the outer quadrature, and then the diagonal lines coming out, joining the, the corners of the two. And here, maybe we'll look at that. is a picture of the heavenly city described in John's Apocalypse from a mid 11th century manuscript now in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. The painting, this painting, was made as a meditation aid to accompany the best known commentary of the Apocalypse at the time, written by a 9th century monk in northern Spain named Beatus of Libania. There are many such manuscripts made in the Middle Ages and all of them contain a picture of the heavenly city. Here are two more. From the monastery of Silos, uh, and another much later and for a different commentary uh, from the Trinity Apocalypse. So this is the Silos one here uh, on the left uh, and the Trinity Apocalypse on the right. Looking at that, pay attention to the corners. When I first considered this picture at the Getty Institute over 20 years ago, I could not understand why there were heart shapes at each corner. There were so many allegorical possibilities, but none of them seemed to be terribly sensible. So I showed it to two artists who were there that year, and they immediately said, oh, that lets you see it as a cube uh, with the walls folding upwards. This, of course, had never occurred to me, being but a historian of literature. And I still didn't really get it. Um, I have to admit that spatial relationships was not my better technical skill at school. <clears throat> I didn't get it until I came across the drawing for a cube in Gerbert's text and recognized in it the underlying geometry of this painting. When the heart shapes, here, here, and here, and like so, there, when those heart shapes 
are imagined folded up together along the diagonals, the walls will rise up along the four sides of the inner square, forming, still an imagination, of course, for this picture has never been actually folded, five of the six sides of a solid cube. The sixth side, the top, is our viewing station, as it was in that circular building uh, I showed you from the Hortus uh, Divisiarum earlier. As I said, we'll come back to that one. So we often get this, our viewing station is often from directly above. And the top, looking down in this case through the crystalline city as clear as glass, you remember, which is what John says. And notice also how the diagonals are emphasized in the painting by the angel's measuring rod, which you have here. And this is really a kind of uh, convention in a lot of these manuscripts that the angel's measuring rod is not held horizontally, but is always held up at an angle at the diagonal. Now, if you try to make a cubic box, I'm saying this to people who are not skilled in uh, spatial relations. <clears throat> like me. Um, if you try to make a cubic box from a flat piece of paper, you will likely proceed more or less as this figure requires that you do, by drawing a central square, then making a fold or perhaps a cut between each of the inner square's corners and the corresponding outer corners of the paper in order to fold up the four upright sides. Next time you have takeout, <laughs> look at how your paper box is put together. You can perceive the same basic geometry at work in this heavenly city, uh, which was designed by the monk Maius in the mid 10th century. This one, uh, oh wait a minute, sorry, this one here, that's now in the Morgan Library. Designed by the monk Maius in the mid 10th century, a bit before Gerbert composed his geometry treatise, and which now is in the Morgan Library. This suggests to me, of course, that this particular figure for a cubit was in circulation before Gerbert. It's not original with Gerbert. And here again, you can get, a, notice the diagonal. There we go. We're going to go very much on the diagonal. And here, the diagonals here. You imagine those folded together at the side of each will come up. And here again, in the 12th century Silos painting, and even still in the mid-13th century Trinity Apocalypse, you get exactly that basic geometry at work. And that uh, in the Trinity Apocalypse, and in Trinity Apocalypse is a different uh, ap apocalyptic commentary, it's French. Um, but in the Trinity Apocalypse here, you'll notice that the angels pointing and John is looking in that direction as well. The cube, or cell, in monastic contemplative writing was a particularly productive three-dimensional space, and not, I think, only because it was a basic module of Romanesque monastic architecture. And this is the last of the uh, quotes that I'm giving you. Um, it's on the handout. Did I not put it up here? I guess I didn't put it up here. We'll go back to that prettier picture. Peter of Sell, a Benedictine abbot of the late 12th century, friend of John of Salisbury and of the great Victorine contemplatives, extolled the virtues of meditating in his cell thus. After my daily burdens, and thirsting in some measure for the silence of my cell, I draw deeply from the quiet which has now been granted to me. The mind has a more extensive and expansive leisure within the six surfaces of a cell than it could gain on the outside by traversing the four parts of the world. In fact, the smaller the place, the more extended the mind, for when the body is constrained, the mind takes flight. <clears throat> 
A limit upon the body expands the mind, and if no one interrupts, my mind leaps as high and as far and as deep as it wants. And this is from his treatise called On Affliction and Reading, uh, which is in the collection of works of Peter of Sell uh, that's available through the Cistercian Library. <clears throat> but Peter's cell is imaginary, for his monastery actually had none. Like most monasteries of the time, the brothers used a common dormitory and a common refectory. He's withdrawn to a quiet place in his mind, imagining the productive, efficacious, solid form of a six-sided cube. And this remained the favored shape for meditation in the centuries to come, as it had been in centuries before. Well, I know this has been a very packed talk, and you may well be feeling a bit disoriented, despite my continuing invocations of geometry. But in the next two lectures, I will return to these themes in more detail, and I promise more slowly. And tomorrow, I want to start by considering just what the topica of argument were thought to be, and why this method of thinking was so closely bound up with our very ability to invent successfully. For to remind you again, the topics are the seats of arguments, the wellsprings of our cognitions, and the originators of our speaking. Thank you. Very good point. I quite agree with you. I mean, oblitus meaning literally, of course, it gives us, of course, our words obliterate and oblivion and so forth and so on. I mean, it's our standard word as it was in Latin for forgetting. Uh, but I think very much they had the wax tablet, actually, not necessarily the slate, but the wax tablet earlier on, which, of course, the beauty of a wax tablet, which they used for all kinds of ephemeral jotting of ideas and sketchings and one thing or another, is that you just take the other end of the stylus, and erase it. At that point, it's gone into the past. Hopefully, you've learned it, because, of course, if you can't remember it, you haven't learned it. Um, but if you should be so unlucky as to have obliterated your, your wax tablet before it quite gets in here, uh, you do have ways of uh, finding it again using investigatio and remnantiva, but that's exactly right. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Um, a couple of weeks ago, Martin Lewis from uh, Wales College was here to give a talk on cities of refuge, um, on cities built in the 17th and 18th century uh, for religious refugees, mm -hmm. uh, Huguenots in, in uh, Germany and so on, um, that were patterned according to the square, uh, that were looking at these images and not putting the church in the middle as it was customary in traditional villages, um, in trying to kind of translate this, not as a cube, but as a map. And I wonder, when did this happen, that one lost the memory of the cube? and ended up with a map. I mean, when did they, did they take out flatten? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it ever did get lost. I mean, remember the Middle Ages has lots of memory. I have lots of maps too. In fact, we have a foremost authority sitting here on medieval maps. But maps are for contemplation and remembrance. And the other thing about medieval maps, I think I'm right about this, it's that, first of all, they have to be understood as spheres. I mean, a medieval map is not flat. 
And remember, they're always drawn in a circle, and that is a representation of a sphere. They, this, this business about thinking of it as a flat earth, it's, it's a canard. They, they understood these, uh, indeed, as circles, as spheres, rather. And they draw mountains and things on it like that. So it's like a, a, a kind of two-dimensional, again, yeah, it's a two-dimensional um, projection. It has to be two-dimensional because it's on a flat surface, right? <coughs> but someone who understands that using their imaginations can actually translate it into a three-dimensional surface. So I don't think that maps, um, I don't think maps were ever understood to be flat. Um, and as far as squares are concerned, that's very interesting to me about these dead cities of refuge, uh, because the square for a very long time, and I do think it's antique, I don't think it's specific to Christianity at all, um, is, uh, is associated with, with meditation and contemplation, the mind being able to expand within the six surfaces of itself. Um, it's interesting to me that they would have remembered it that long, actually, although I think what you're talking about, I think what's being talked about is late 17th century, and by then they still had very much uh, contact with the ancient and medieval tradition. It gets lost, I think, later on, I think it's 18th and I think it also has something to do with, with our, our now uh, complete uh, um, faith uh, and insistence upon menstrual accuracy. You know, and we don't like maps like they do in the Middle Ages. We don't think they're accurate. How did you ever navigate getting somewhere on one of those things? Mm -hmm. Could you say um, perhaps a little bit more about your definition of a diagram. I'm sorry, but I'm a little bit confused. In particular, the di how do you differentiate between a diagram and an image, a general image? Do come tomorrow. What? I said do come tomorrow, if you can. Ah, <laughs> Processes of thinking and of, and of, uh, of memory. I appreciate it very much. I'm just going to ask a very mundane question, which I think everyone wants to ask you, which is Have paper reproductions ever been made of these and folded? Oh. No. It hasn't, and because I don't think it's occurred to the um, librarians and uh, curators who are in charge of this. Right. I mean, I've been talking to various art historian friends of mine and shown them that Herbert. Uh, uh, figure, geometric figure, and nobody really seems to understand it. And John Williams, of course, did the great uh, catalog of all of these manuscripts. He talks about this figure here as he's rather mysterious. I mean, he says that it, he, it seems to be Roman, but he's not entirely sure. Uh, and that um, it, he describes it as the walls being, being exploded outwards floating walls outwards, uh, which is fine. I mean, that, that certainly is true here. It doesn't actually explain what's going on in the square there. I mean, you can only think of it that way as, as being some sort of funny little kind of decoration, or whatever else you want to call it. Um, he also makes the comment, which I find extremely interesting, that in these apocalypse manuscripts, unfortunately, I didn't make a picture of this one, but if you look at the other depictions of the city, of cities, walled cities, they tend to be done in a much more common Roman form, which is that you drop the front wall below the, the back wall, right? So there's an, a, 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 an effort to produce pr perspective. But for the heavenly city itself, it's always this, always this. So that also seemed to me to have something to do uh, with the specialness of this particular uh, figure, image, architectural diagram for this particular city uh, in this particular context. And all I can think, and I will be talking about this a bit on tomorrow, one of the things it seems to me is that these diagrams, diagrams like this do, they deliberately ask you to use your imagination. You really enter into that picture. You can't just sit back 
all the people do all the time, of course. And that's the pretty picture. Because it doesn't make any sense. Thank you for um, a really rich exploration, and I'm so looking forward to the next few talks. And my question channeled in was even learned. So you have looked at these images as um, going, coming from architecture to look at these illuminations, and you seem to sit in them as double squares. So mm -hmm. as double squares where the geometry itself is, again, based on the diagonal, which I thought was super interesting, yeah. you're talking about how the, um, the characters are all emphasized on the diagonal. Um, so of laying the plan for a church and then taking that up into the three dimensions, and I was just wondering if you had, I, I think it's very convincing, the arguments that you put forward, um, and if you thought about it in terms of build, building as well. Like how, how does that nexus work? Well, my very good friend, Stephen Murray, has done very good work on that. I kind of leave it to him, actually. And also, to, I'll tell you, one of, the, one, of the ways, one of the people who got me started thinking about this works is someone who's here at Penn, actually, and that's Bob Osterhout. Uh, because, and this was when he was still in Illinois, so I remember he told me the story about how he would get his architect, history of architecture students off into a spare football field, which they have a lot of in Illinois, <laughs> um, and would walk off the measurements, right? And they would have to imagine it coming like that. Um, I will to tomorrow be talking about a number of instances, textual instances, where people, mostly Claire Alfarex actually, uh, are describing this kind of, of figure, but entirely verbally, starting with a plane, and then at some point you have to pull it up, as you do with this. Yeah. Um, I totally buy the diagonal in the first of the images that you saw. I'm not buying it so much in the Trinity College Apocalypse. I mean, if I wanted to, if I wanted to fold this into a square, mm -hmm. I would look at the bricks and I would say, that's one wall there, that's right. so I'm going to fold that up. Is that what you were saying? That's what this I was is saying. another wall. That's, that's right. That really is what I was saying. Which isn't, which isn't so, which isn't as smart as the Gerbert one. And I wonder whether that's because this isn't actually, this wasn't a manuscript for a very smart person. I mean, it was a... Exactly. wonderful exhibit on color uh, in, uh, in Cambridge. It was this last summer. Uh, and I looked at that, uh, that this, this page was displayed, and I thought to myself, gee, where are the diagonals on this? Because you're absolutely not sure. Then I saw the way in which the bricks work on this. And it seems obviously that to be folded up. I suppose what could happen is that you could think of that as a kind of flap behind the other wall. And that would bring it to um, I don't think so. I, mean, so I don't think you no, you just fold fold this bit up and uh -huh. then you fold that bit up that way. Oh, okay. And this, and this bit up that way and that bit up that way and you just make a box and you stick a bit of sellotape around it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's some of the So you have to fold, you can't put a fold all the way across the width of the square. The first fold goes, the first, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It, so you, 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 you imagination that it actually doesn't happen. You make a snip there. <laughs> yeah. and, then, okay. and then you fold it up there, and you make a snip there, and you fold it up there. That's why I was thinking, maybe you cut it, that that would work. Yeah. 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 But it's very literal, and not rooted in show. And it's a matter of vernacular. This is how you. That's right. Yeah. That's how you do it. Yeah. And that is please. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the view from the top of the Holy City. And I wonder if it's not partly numerical. That you have to see 12. It's so important that there are 12. And that there's no symmetry. 
Maybe on the left, on the south here in the north, but to the east, to the west. If you wouldn't see that, you could just put the front and look in. The that's exactly right. It would, the part of it would be hidden. So that's, yes. Thank you. Circles and spheres in the third talk. <laughs> um, it is an absolutely standard, long standing uh, meditation shape. Uh, I've lost track of the So that an exact geometry is going to always be earth-bound. So it is already a translation of divinity into human terms. 
So of course these boundaries would look a little funny. And maybe that that's partly what's going on here as well. Maybe we come to maybe yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I have two questions um, that are maybe related. Uh, the first question is, when we are mentally folding these groups, are we meant to fold the sides up, creating the image on the inside, or um, down and then sort of creating the image on the outside, or does it not matter? Well, in this case, it would matter a good deal because you're looking down into the head of the city. I mean, those those are gateways, so those walls have to be up. Okay, so don't get ahead of me. I've got to die. Are we seeing myself. Um, inside the head? We are inside here because I, I forgot to tell you this. With these two weird looking figures inside there, uh, that thing that looks like a goat, that's the Lamb of God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is here. And the okay. Lamb of God is not on the top of the head of the city. Right? Okay, so right. that's. <laughs> that so that's my question. That was my first question. But it, I, can, I, can, I can see that with some uses of that geometry, the output may be the same. That may be true. I just haven't done a concept. Okay, well, my second question is uh, if, if we are indeed um, meant to imagine this as an uh, enclosed, arcaded space. Might not the cloister also be a useful architectural space to think about um, these images evoking as well as the cell? And use constantly. Yes. Various treatises on the cloister from about the latter part of the 12th century. Um, I think that we are going to bring this piece <coughs> to a close. I really want to thank Mary for astounding talk. You've given us the geometrical sublime and geometrical practicality <laughs> all in one. Um, and I'm going to ask all of you uh, to thank Mary and then to proceed in way out there that way to what is uh, And you also have a free And uh, also to an exhibit yes. of manuscripts in the Lee Library over there. So you can go to the manuscript and you can go to the food and the reception but not <laughs> <laughs> Not at the same time. <laughs> <laughs>